Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Metabolism and Menopause podcast. My name is Stephanie, and I am your host and CEO of Vitality OET. We are a women's nutrition, health, and fitness company that focuses predominantly on women's hormones, particularly as they start going through perimenopause and onwards. We know that you start experiencing so many different symptoms in this time of your life, whether it be hot flashes, night sweats, irritability, brain fog, or of course, weight gain around the middle that seems to have come out of absolutely nowhere, despite you not changing anything. So you go back to your tried and true methods of cutting calories, cutting carbs, doing a bunch of cardio, yet nothing seems to be working. In fact, you're just more tired, your sleep is getting worse, and the scale might actually start moving in the wrong direction. But we know now that your body is inherently different than what it was prior to you experiencing these hormonal changes. So our mission here at Vitality is to help you understand how your body changes in this time of your life. So you can reach your health and fitness goals, live a life full of vitality, finally feel in control and at home in your body again, and really understand how to take care of this new body of yours. So today, what I want to cover is how and what to eat for menopause and get you into a better position to go into a fat loss phase as well. And these rules will still apply when you're in a fat loss phase. So supporting that transitional life part of your life is going to require assessing a lot of different areas in your life. So today I'm just going to cover the nutrition piece because there's lifestyle, there's your sleep hygiene, there's activity, there's so many things. But today I'm just going to focus solely on nutrition. So basically what's important in the way you eat, how to eat to support menopause, and ideally a good healthy body composition. So first and foremost, the most important part is going to be that we need enough calories. And I know that's an incredibly scary thought because you've been told for years and years and years, you need to eat less, move more, eat less, move more. Um, And then you're told that, you know, you need less energy because you're aging. So the move is to cut calories, therefore, right? But that's not the case. Eating enough calories is incredibly important. So how does that even work? Think of your metabolism like a campfire. So your metabolism is how many calories your body burns at rest. And the calories that are coming into your body are like the little baby sticks that you put in, the kindling that gets lit up by the flame, okay? So we can't visually see that there is a tiny, so we can see that there's a tiny little fire if you only have a little bit of kindling, right? There are no more sticks being thrown into that fire to help keep that fire going. So the fire is like your metabolism. You need to have adequate fuel to keep that going. So what happens is if we're not eating enough, we can't support our metabolism. So our body gets poor at burning calories. We're not very good at it. Um, And that fire gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It can't grow. It can't get any hotter. It can't improve. So eventually it'll burn out and it'll be a struggle to get it going again. Now, if we add more sticks, more calories, that flame is going to grow. It's going to get hotter. It's going to burn longer. So by strategically giving your body more calories more frequently, your metabolism is going to pick up and learn to power through those calories as fuel and not store them as fat. Without enough calories, our body also isn't going to want to do more. So what this means is your body just keeps functioning at the bare minimum. Okay, it wants to do this on the calorie level and it's going to get rid of everything that's not essential. So this includes hormone production. It's not essential. You can survive without hormones, but it sure doesn't feel good. You're exhausted. You're not sleeping well. Your hair is thinning. Your skin is getting worse. It feels like you're aging more quickly. There is more bloating. Um, Your libido goes down. Like There's so many things that happen when hormone production decreases. The symptoms are going to come on crazy fast when menopause hits because of our hormones tanking when we're not eating enough. And if we are constantly giving our body just enough calories to get by, it, like how safe do you think it feels for it to go above and beyond that? It doesn't want to. It's going to hold on to things. It's, it's playing defense. While we think of our hormones and hormonal function as essential, the body actually does not because it's not required for you to live. So just like building muscle, it will put that on the back burner where it sees fit. So you're not going to be able to put on muscle mass. Um, and you're going to see, again, your hair thinning and starting to fall out and all these things because it's just not important. 
when your body is trying to survive, it doesn't care if your hair is luscious, not a thing. So eating enough food is the most important part. If you need help calculating this, just message me, book a free consultation. We will do that for you. No questions asked. Um, we will ask you, that's not true. We will ask you a lot of questions because we need to fully understand what your current situation is, what your past situation was like, all your health, all your chronic conditions, past dieting history, activity, any digestive issues, sleep, stress, energy, digestion. We're going to ask you a lot, um, but that's to give us everything that we need to understand what your body has been through, understand what your body needs, what is lacking, so we can give you the right calorie goal for you and also how to get there. Number two is carbs. Taking in enough carbs is going to be key. Carbs are the body's preferred energy fuel source. Glucose is what your brain wants. It's what we thrive on. So fatigue, brain fog, muscle weakness, um, lightheadedness, these can all kick in if we aren't having enough carbohydrates. Carbs are also critically essential for thyroid function. The thyroid works in part in our body to help support the breakdown of cortisol. It also helps determine how many calories our body burns at rest. It's like a little thermostat dial. So we obviously want to make sure that cortisol is getting out of our body. It's getting broken down, that stress hormone, broken down and getting out. Otherwise, it can lead to dysfunction um, in our HPA axis, which is our stress response system. We will be stuck in fight or flight and make all our hormonal symptoms worse. So carbohydrates can actually help improve thyroid function. So our body burns more calories at rest, but also it's going to help us lower our cortisol in our body, which is incredibly important because if you've listened to past podcasts, we know that cortisol is one of the main driving issues, if not the main driving issue that is really behind a lot of the cause, like the root cause of everything else that you're starting to experience. Do not be fearful when it comes to carbs. I know this is something that is scary because we've really demonized carbs, which is wild to me. We've helped women improve their insulin resistance by making sure they're having adequate carbs. We have helped women improve their metabolism, build up muscle mass, lose body fat, all by increasing carbohydrate intake. So we just need to make sure that we're getting a quality, like good balance of quality carbs in our diet. So like we're looking for whole foods where we can 80% of the time, 20% fun. So we want sustaining high fiber, valuable carbs coming from fruit, potatoes, rice, oats, quinoa. Um, you know, those even honey can count into that veggies. And then we want 20% of our carbs to come from fun food food sources. So this can be things like breads, cereal, cookies, even chips. It's not realistic to completely eliminate those from your diet forever because you're not going to stick to it anyways. It's really important that we get enough quality foods, but again, having those fun foods are just going to help make everything a lot easier. It's going to make it more sustainable and something you can just stick to for the rest of your life, which is what we all want. We don't want to be quote unquote on a diet for the rest of our lives. The next one I want to touch on when it comes to carbohydrates as well as fiber. So are you pooping? Big question, you guys. Fiber is going to play a huge source in this. And the reason that I ask you this is because if we're not having regular bowel movements, we can actually reabsorb hormones that our body is trying to get rid of. So it can lead to hormonal imbalances, making our menopausal symptoms worse. So having adequate fiber in your diet during perimenopause and menopause and really get throughout your entire lifetime, but particularly during perimenopause and menopause is really important. We want to make sure you have a good balance of both sources of fiber. So there's insoluble fiber and soluble fiber. So insoluble fiber helps pass food quicker. So if you're struggling with constipation, you can look at incorporating more insoluble sources of fiber. Um, So some insoluble sources. So it adds bulking fiber, if you, you think of it that way. So this is things like nuts, potatoes, green beans, cauliflower, whole grain bread. And then we also have something called soluble fiber and soluble fiber attracts water into the GI tract, acting like a gel like agent and it slows digestion. So this can be again from oats, um, peas and beans, apples and carrots, 
And you want to have a good mix of both because if you have too much insoluble fiber, um, you are going to see that you can be constipated actually because there's too much bulk to it and not enough, not enough liquid. Soluble fiber brings water into it. So you want to have, again, a good mix of both because too much of one and not enough of the other can really um, throw off your bowel movements for you. So it's something that's a good thing to assess. Typically, you want to be aiming for anywhere between 20 and 30 grams. It'll be a little bit different for everyone, depending on if you have any um, digestive issues. So ulcerative colitis, you'll be a little bit lower, for example. So you have to play around with that yourself. You want to be consistent in fiber intake because if you're 40 grams one day, 10 the next, you're definitely going to be bloated. You're definitely going to be constipated. We want to stay within like a five to 10 gram range. And when we're increasing, typically I like to say two to four grams a week, just because changing your fiber content too much can definitely lead to bloating and constipation because your body isn't used to digesting it. The next important thing is protein. Protein is so important during perimenopause and menopause for a number of reasons. The first one is muscle building. We already know that when in perimenopause and menopause, when estrogen goes down, we have a much harder time being able to build and maintain muscle mass because estrogen is a, what we call an anabolic hormone. It's building. So it helps build muscle. When we lose that, um, we are going to struggle a bit more. We know that if testosterone also goes down during perimenopause and menopause, if you're one of those women that has low testosterone levels, this is going to be even harder for you. If you are someone who is um, doing a ton of cardio, who is very stressed out, um, you are going to see an increased cortisol response. So that's stress hormone, which is actually going to break down muscle for energy to provide and then turn it into sugar in your bloodstream to provide you with energy. So that will make it even harder to build and maintain muscle mass as well. And we know maintaining muscle mass is so, so important for aging in all populations, but particularly women during perimenopause and onwards um, for a multitude of reasons. Because one, having muscle makes you more insulin sensitive. Your body is able to control blood sugars a lot better if you have more muscle mass. Um, it's also really important for obviously maintaining your independence, your strength, decreasing fall risk. Um, also incredibly important. We know that the more muscle you have, um, you're just going to be more fit looking, more toned looking. If you don't have any muscle mass and you're losing weight, you're not going to see any definition or necessarily look fit. So you need to make sure you're maintaining muscle as well. And the more muscle you have, it's been linked with better health outcomes as well as you're aging. So incredibly important. And it is harder to build and maintain in, in perimenopause and menopause. And protein is very important for building muscle. Without it, it will not happen. Not to mention also very important for hair growth, nail growth, those kinds of things. It's also important to note that protein is more satiating. So it's going to keep us full longer. Um, this is really great, especially if you're someone who struggles with energy crashes, if we're having more cravings. When you are having a higher protein diet, you are going to notice that it's not happening as much because it slows down the digestive process. Um, you are going to see that our blood sugar stabilize more because since food is going to empty out of our stomach more slowly, we're not going to get a blood sugar spike and drop, which means we're not going to experience that energy crash, that sugar crash, where we then end up having a bunch of cravings. So protein is very helpful for that as well. And then of course, the thermic effect of food. So it actually takes a lot of energy to break down and digest protein in your, during the digestive process. So the energy is being called on from your metabolism. So the more protein you eat, the more calories you burn just from digesting your food. So it's somewhere between like for carbs and fat, five to 15% of the calories that you eat, you burn in the digestive process. So I, if I ate hundred calories of fat or hundred calories of carbs, I would be burning anywhere from five to 15 calories of that during digestion. With protein, it's closer to 20 to 30%. So if I'm eating 100 calories of protein, we're looking at like anywhere from 20 to 30 calories getting burdened in the digestive process. This is why you get like the meat sweats when you have a lot of meat and you get hot. It's a thermic effect of food. It takes a lot of energy to break that down. So those are foods to eat things to prioritize, eating enough food, having enough carbs and fiber, and having enough protein. 
Protein, typically you want to aim for 0.8 grams to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight. Typically, I max people at around 150 grams because then digestion seems to take a hit. When it comes to carbs, how much you need, it's going to be more than protein. The Sorry, the more active that you are, the more stressed that you are, the more carbohydrate that you're going to need. And again, you want to increase that slowly. So now food order when you eat. This is something that doesn't get talked about enough, which can make a huge change on your blood sugars, um, how full you feel as well. So you're not having cravings and improving your energy. It's important for so many reasons and insulin resistance is one of them. So we know that when estrogen goes down during perimenopause and menopause, we are going to struggle more with controlling our blood sugars because that is one of the roles that estrogen has. It's helping control blood sugar. So we become more insulin resistant, which means our body isn't good at listening to insulin. It requires a lot more insulin to do its job to open cells and shuttle sugar into muscle cells, for example. When that's not happening, it ends up getting shuttled to fat cells, which we do not want. So insulin resistance just means our body isn't great at handling blood sugars um, and breaking down carbs on their own and shuttling those sugars to the right places. So how, like I mentioned, I still, you still need to eat carbs, right? Very important for improving cortisol because if cortisol is too high, your blood sugar is going to go up anyways. So how can I eat carbs without seeing a blood sugar spike? Start by eating part of your protein and part of your veggies first at your meal. Um, the reason for this is A, protein is very filling and we need the most of it. So starting with protein is always very helpful to help you reach your goals. You want to make sure veggies as well. So the reason that we do veggies and protein first or doing most of our protein and veggies first before dipping into our carbs is that it helps us get full sooner. It empties our stomach more slowly, which then helps our blood sugar response. We're not getting a spike and drop from digestion happening too quickly. So then once you've already had part of your protein and part of your veggies, now you can dip into your carbs and we don't have to worry about your blood sugars as much. It makes a huge, huge difference. This is why people are like, oh, you can't have potatoes. It'll raise your blood sugars. Yes, you can. Just make sure you have most of your chicken and some veggies first and then have it. Like when I go out for supper, I'll have my side salad. I'll eat most of my chicken and then I'll dip into my pasta or whatever, whatever carb I'm having. It makes a huge difference that you're getting the carbohydrates for energy. So you're not feeling sluggish. So you are balancing your blood sugars this way while still having your carbs by lowering your cortisol. So it's a very simple, easy way to manipulate how your blood sugars will respond without cutting out food groups, which is amazing because pasta is amazing. So there are two other things that I really like to talk about in terms of meal timing, and this is bedtime snack and breakfast. And I know people are very big on fasting. There are some professionals out in the field and things like that, doctors who really preach fasting. Fasting is not appropriate for everyone, unfortunately. So with fasting, what we see is if you are already under eating, if you are already not hitting your protein goals, if you are already tired, reducing your meals so that you're not having consistent energy throughout the day can be really detrimental for women because it can increase that cortisol response. And a lot of women already really struggle to get their protein in. Like if you are 150 pounds, like you need to be getting like 120 grams of protein minimum a day. Most women aren't even getting 60. So if you are only eating in like a five hour window, an eight hour window, trying to get that much protein in from whole food sources is next to impossible. Um, if you're drinking it and having in smoothies and bars and protein powders, like sure, it's easier to hit because those things aren't filling. But those are also highly processed and can really affect your digestion, um, fill the sugar alcohols and things like that. But if you're getting the majority of your food, doing that 80% whole foods, trying to eat that much like from chicken and beans and, you know, beef and all these things, in a short eating window, you are not going to feel super great. It's not, it's not awesome. Um, I'm also not in the business of telling people not to eat. So here is our reason for making sure you're having breakfast and eating within an hour of waking. You see, when we sleep all night, our cortisol levels need to be regulated. Without breakfast, so 
what happens is cortisol is supposed to be high in the morning and then it tapers down as the day goes on, is low at nighttime so you can sleep and then it spikes in the morning and you wake up. So what happens is if we are not having breakfast, our cortisol just keeps going up and up and up and up. And we know that with cortisol, we have a very negative loop of events that happens. We have lower sex hormone production. Thyroid function goes down. Our blood sugar control goes out the window. Our liver health actually decreases. Our gut health decreases. Our metabolism slows down, which means our bodies suck at burning calories, making weight loss very challenging. So within about an hour of waking, we want to make sure that you are having a breakfast that has protein and has carbs. This is going to help keep you full, set you up for a successful day by making it easier to hit your protein goals, um, by helping align your hormones and bring those cortisol levels down and just set you up in a much better position for hormonal harmony, improving your hormonal symptoms, and also for your waste management or weight management. Many people believe that skipping breakfast, they're able to save their calories and hit their deficit. However, fasting is actually going to increase your blood sugar dysregulation and promote muscle loss. So we know when we aren't eating enough, our body will actually see a rise in cortisol, our stress hormone, which will then break down muscle mass, which we know is very important and hard to build and maintain during perimenopause and menopause. Um, that breakdown is going to be broken down to amino acids. Those amino acids get to the liver and get turned into sugars that get pumped into our bloodstream. So even in the absence of eating, cortisol is dumping sugar into your bloodstream by breaking down muscle mass. Okay. So then insulin comes up to try and combat this and try and shuttle sugars where it needs to be, which we're already more insulin resistant when estrogen goes down. Um, sugars will then decrease in the bloodstream. Then you're still not eating. You're still fasting. So then cortisol is like, ah, oh, still need more energy break down more muscle, turn it into sugar, dump it in the bloodstream. And the cycle will continue and continue and continue until you eat. Okay. So it's, you can see how it's going to mess up your blood sugar control and your muscle mass, which is not going to help with your insulin resistance, which is not going to help you look fit and toned. Um, plus then most people are working out fasted, which increases cortisol even more. And I doubt the reason that you're working out is to lose muscle and have poor blood sugar control. So these are things that you need to be aware of during perimenopause and menopause. And can it work for some people? Sure. But every single woman who has come through our program that I have spoken to is already under eating, not getting enough protein, not seeing results in the gym and not eating and skipping meals is not going to change that. So that was breakfast. The other thing that we really encourage, which shocks a lot of people, is a bedtime snack. So yes, you can eat after 8 p.m. You're not going to turn into a pumpkin. Nothing bad's going to happen. We want you to have a good night's sleep. We know this is an issue during perimenopause and menopause. Um, and actually having a snack before bed can really help improve your sleep quality, which will then decrease your cortisol levels, which will increase your growth hormones. You can have better muscle repair and see all the changes from all the work that you're actually putting in the gym. So your bedtime snack should consist of protein or, and a fat or a fat source compared to the compare to the complex carb. So what this does is the carbohydrate brings cortisol down, like we talked about, which allows melatonin, our sleepy hormone, to come up. This is why you feel like you have the best night's sleep after Thanksgiving and things like that is from the mashed potatoes and all the carbohydrates that you have at those meals. So what you want to know is, okay, carbs will decrease cortisol, which allow melatonin, your sleepy hormone, to come up. But the type of carb matters because you want to have a slow digesting carb, which means it empties your stomach slowly meaning your blood sugars are going to stay stable throughout the night. That way you don't have a blood sugar spike and drop because when your blood sugar drops like that, cortisol is going to spike up because it needs to break down muscle to put sugar into your bloodstream to provide you with energy and you wake up from that. So some really great options that you can have are oatmeal with protein powder or like some of the fair life milk in there. You can do yogurt with protein powder and granola. Typically we say avoid fruits before bed because they digest a little bit too too quickly. Uh, I love popcorn and a turkey pepperoni stick before bed. Easily one of my favorites. Um, toast with some peanut butter, also a great option. 
You can make those protein balls. You can do um, meat, cheese, and crackers. There are so many options for a great bedtime snack. Um, And you can play around and see what you enjoy, what helps you sleep better. But this is why when we're having candy before bed or ice cream or chocolate, we tend to wake up. Sometimes we'll have hot flashes from that blood sugar change as well. Um, And you will wake up because your blood sugar spikes. You might be able to fall asleep okay, but then your blood sugar is going to tank at nighttime from those food choices, and then you're going to wake up. So having a slow digesting carb before bed with carb with um sorry fat or protein can make a huge difference for your sleep quality. Okay, so and again you can have that within like an hour to ninety minutes before going to bed. Um, yeah, doesn't have to be super complicated. Doesn't have to be super big. Only like a couple hundred calories, you're good to go. The next one to think about is caffeine. Regulating a healthy dose of caffeine. Um, Too much caffeine can lead to a lot of issues. And this is not me telling you not to have coffee because I love me my coffee, Um, especially the hazelnut coffee you can get at Costco, the beans and you grind it from home. Amazing. But having too much caffeine can lead to energy crashes, increased anxiety. It absolutely spikes your cortisol levels increases hot flashes and night sweats through dilation of your blood vessels, um, and can lead to GI issues as well. So most people can have one cup of coffee a day with no effect in symptoms increasing. If you want to have caffeine later on or coffee later on, make sure it's caffeine free, but don't forget about the things that have caffeine that you're having later. So things like chocolate, for example, sodas have lots of caffeine as well. Um, so avoiding caffeine after 2 PM is also important for you, but Again, caffeine can really make hot flashes worse um, during perimenopause and menopause. And coffee doesn't actually provide us with energy. It just blocks us from feeling tired. So you're not actually giving yourself energy to do things. You're just increasing cortisol, which will speed up breaking things down and pumping sugars into your bloodstream so that you have the energy to do things. But the caffeine itself and what you're having doesn't provide you with energy which you should be aware of. It just prevents you from feeling tired. So that's why you feel crashes later because you didn't actually provide your body with anything usable. The next one, which is easily one of the most important things aside from eating enough food is food consistency. Inconsistent intake is a huge stressor on the body. Um, If the body is constantly having to guess how much energy it's going to get that day compared to the next, it's just going into this fight or flight kind of survival mode. It would be like, you know, everyone's had that bad relationship where you're just not really sure how that person's going to react. So you're kind of walking on eggshells. You're kind of on defense. Like, are they in a good mood today? Are they in a bad mood today? Do I share this with them today? Will they receive it well today? You're, You're playing defense. You're just, you can't really like thrive per se. Whereas in a good, healthy relationship, it's like, you don't have to worry. You're not walking on eggshells. You can share anything and know nothing bad is going to happen. They're going to be supportive. That's a good, healthy relationship. That's what our body is like when you're having consistent calorie intake. It's like it can breathe again. It can, it can be good. It can be present. It can thrive. It's not, not in survival mode. So what happens though is when we have this inconsistent calorie intake, so one day might be 2,200, the next might be 1,500, maybe we're at 1,800, 1,200, like you're just going up and down all over the place. Our body just ends up holding on to that energy that it's being given because it knows that some days are high, some days are low. So better just take it when it gets it and hold on to it because we don't know if we're going to drop into that low state again. So what ends up happening is your metabolism starts to slow down because it starts adapting to living in maintenance at those low calorie days and any days that you're higher, it's going to store that as fat because that's how our metabolism works. It adjusts to what you are signaling it to do, the stimulus, the environment that it's in. So when we are always having those low calorie days spread out, or maybe we're low calorie for like four days, five days, and then we're high for two on the weekend, and then we're really low again, we learn to live in maintenance at that low calorie intake. So anytime you're above that, you're gaining weight, which is not what you want because it makes our, our weight loss efforts a lot more challenging and hormonally, it's going to do a lot to your body as well. We're going to see cortisol goes up because of that stress, of the inconsistency, the not knowing the walking on eggshells at that same time, we're going to see insulin resistance start to go up and together. Those two are going to lead to some belly fat storage. 
a slowing of metabolism, so our body burns less calories at rest, blood sugar issues that affect your energy, your mood, your hunger levels, even your brain function. You got some brain fog going on, hard to concentrate. And then additionally, we have our thyroid. So like I said, our thyroid is like our thermostat. It determines how many calories our body burns at rest. So when it slows down, our body burns less calories. And you can imagine it's quite challenging to lose weight if your body's not good at burning calories. Our thyroid also slows down with this inconsistent calorie intake. The thyroid and cortisol levels within your body are going to together dictate the balance of your sex hormones of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. And that imbalance is going to start happening. It's going to be created. We're going to see a lot more exhaustion, making it harder to want to work out, right? We're tired. We're not motivated. Um, when you're tired, it's really easy to say, I'm going to have that donut instead of, you know, the, that bowl of fruit right there that's on the counter. Um, then you're going to also experience other hormonal symptoms, which are going to vary depending on which hormones are imbalanced. Um, but typically that's going to be a low libido, weight gain or weight loss resistance. Um, we're going to be more tired, not sleeping well, hot flashes, thinning hair, more bloating, um, blood sugar control issues, you name it, it's probably going on. So with the inconsistent calories, we're basically teaching our bodies to just hold on to fat as crazy as it sounds by eating more regularly. So consistent day to day, your body is going to be like, oh, okay, we know what we're getting. Awesome. We can burn things off as fat because we're good. We know what's coming in the next day. Not a big deal. We don't have to hold on to all this stuff, which is awesome. So the next thing is what hormones are you lacking? If you have been tested either through a Dutch test with us, or you got some blood work done and you see you're low in some things, you can actually bump those up through certain foods and we can enhance and support the hormones that we might be lacking by getting the right nutrients, for example, like potassium, magnesium, calcium, phosphorus. Those are all huge hormonal supporters, really great for our hormone pathways. Um, you can get those from a wide variety of fruits and veggies, dairy, meats, like red meats and chicken. Um, if you need more estrogen, go to phytoestrogen foods like edamame, to tofu, um, soy, Flax seeds, sesame seed, garlic, amazing. We measure that with the heart in our household. If the recipe says four cloves, we grab eight. Um, if you are low in testosterone, you can have DHEA boosting foods. So this can be like coconut, coconut oil, avocado and avocado oil, nuts, seeds, olives, fatty fish like salmons. And you can even take omega-3 supplements to help with that as well. But those are really the, the basics of what you need to be successful in supporting menopause, your hormone balance. Um, if you can tackle down these things, you'll see improvements in your body composition. You're also going to be set up for success in improving your metabolism so that you can go into a fat loss phase. Because remember how I said, if you have those inconsistent calories, so you eat at 1200 calories most of the time, but then on weekends, maybe you're hitting 2000. Your body learns to maintain at 1200. So we don't want our maintenance to be 1200 because that means if you're going to lose weight, you have to eat below that. And that's not possible for most women because if we're eating below that, we're not eating enough where we see our cortisol levels go up. Like I talked about, and that's going to decrease progesterone production, estrogen, testosterone, thyroid function goes down, blood sugar issues go up, gut health gets worse. We have more inflammation, um, more hormonal symptoms, big time liver function starts to decrease. So you can't go lower. So you need to do something to bring that metabolism back up so that your maintenance can be higher. So that instead of having to be stuck at 1200 calories, now you can eat 2000 calories and you're eating like 1800 to lose. And then you come back up to 2000 and you maintain. That's amazing. That's what you want. So if you can follow these rules that I just outlined, you will be in a great position to bring that metabolism back up. I'm going to summarize them all quickly here for you. So you have them there. So eating enough calories, if you need us to calculate that for you, please just book a consultation or message me. We will do this for free. We do it for every woman who has ever contacted us ever. There's no sales coaching pitch or anything like that. We just want to help you get the information you need to be able to take care of your body. So eating enough calories, eating enough carbohydrates, getting enough fiber, protein, 0.8 grams to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight to a max of about 150. Um, 
paying attention to the order of your food intake. So prioritizing protein and veggies first before dipping into your carbohydrates. Um, making sure you're having breakfast within an hour of waking, bedtime snack an hour, an hour and a half before bed, um, of watching your caffeine intake, focusing on food consistency on a regular basis, um, which is obviously going to take some tracking for the beginning, but that's okay. Like it will make a big difference for you. And then bumping up your food intake to help support the hormones that you might be lacking. If you have any questions on this, if you need any help at all, you have no idea where to start, just message us. We will help you figure that out for free. There's no strings attached. We just want to help you. I hope that this outlined the basics that are really helpful. If you can start with these and tackle one thing at a time each week, you will be well on your way to moving in the right direction. Um, and again, if you need a little bit of help or aren't really sure which thing to focus on first, just message me and I'm always happy to help. I hope you enjoy this episode. Short and sweet, a nice change from lately since they've all been long. Have a great rest of your day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.